I want to take you to the scriptures this morning, and I want you to go to the Ten Commandments. We're doing a reverse countdown, and we are in Exodus chapter 20, and we're talking about their place in our lives. And you've got to remember when you come to the Ten Commandments, God is taking the law and he's summarizing. He's bringing it down to ten uh, absolute truths that we need to have that are part of our moral fiber, that they are part of our system. And you're going to say, well, today this doesn't really apply to me. Oh, yes, it does. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, you'll find these words, and here's what's said. It's just four words, you shall not murder. You say, well, not guilty. Well, let's see. Let's talk about that. Because Jesus talked about this with some modern day New Testament application, and I want you to look at it with me. Uh, you shall not murder. I want to share with you that Cain committed the first murder in history. It's interesting to notice that that first murder was in a family. In fact, you'll see that the majority of people that are murdered by somebody, I want to show you in a minute, uh, are murdered by somebody they know. And uh, that's uh, super tragic, isn't it? So I want to share with you this morning from the Word of God, and I want you to look with me on this topic because it's much broader than you may be thinking. You're like, hey, not guilty, not guilty. I'm on good on this one. Well, let's talk about it. Um, the language in the Hebrew language, uh, the original language for the Old Testament, it's interesting because there's about seven words for kill or murder uh, that uh, exists. And this particular one is the idea, it's the idea of carrying uh, its, its intent or uh, premeditation. But it also carries with it these further definitions. And I want to share these with you. That violence can not just be intentional, but it can be self-murder or what we refer to as in our day suicide. It can be murder itself, or it could be that someone is an accessory to a murder. Would all apply to this command that we're looking at today. I want to share with you some things in Scripture this morning. And I want you to go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 for a minute, because it's so foundational. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, because you're reading a passage that has to do with a universal law. And when I say a universal law, this is prior to the law of God, the first five books of the Bible being spoken, and this seems to be a universal law that will apply to mankind for all time. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, it says these words, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Listen to the cause, the cause and effect, the reason. He says, for in the image of God has God made man. I'll remind you in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it tells us that uh, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We won't even get into that subject today, but that's a, that's a statement of fact that we are created male and female, uh, I'm, I'm going to resist. I'm going to move on. All right? So when God spoke about creation, it's so interesting that you will see the phrase, let there be, and you have the world being spoken of, you'll have the animal kingdom and the different types of animals, and then... When he says and speaks about humanity, he uses a different phrase. Let us make man in our image, in the image of God. And the reason I point that out is because you need to realize, I know yesterday was national, or I should say international uh, dog day. I've had dogs since I was a little boy. I love my dogs. We love our present little, little, uh, little dog. Uh, 
He, uh, he's a blessing. He sort of looked like a teddy bear. Kim, I gave him the name Teddy Berry because he came from me and it was Valentine's, so it was Teddy Berry. So he's, he's our little teddy bear. Man, we love that little thing. I believe everybody in the world should be greeted like Kim and I are greeted at our house. That dog barks and spins and jumps and jumps on the furniture. Then he jumps on us. And then I've got this ritual that I do with him where every time I come, I could go out in the garage for 30 minutes and I'll get this treatment when I come back in. I mean, you, everybody should be treated like that, right? I come in and he will run to the bedroom and he spins over on his back and he wants me to rub his chest and his belly and he gets, and then he'll jump up and kiss my face and hug. And I mean, it's an intense thing. Dogs are wonderful, aren't they? Now, you know, I didn't say anything about cats, but that, this is my sermon, not yours, all right? I'm not gonna say anything about your cats. I don't wanna get in trouble, okay? But I've been a dog person all my life. Dogs are wonderful. And for those of you that are cat lovers, cat lo cats are wonderful too, all right? I'm just gonna leave it like that, all right? Sorry, not sorry. Sorry, sort of sorry, all right? I'll leave it like that. I know some of you really love, love your pets, cats, everything. Okay, we're blessed that way, right? But why does God make such a distinction about human beings? You're special. There is a gap there in creation and you are far above the rest of the animal kingdom and that is reality. There's not really another interpretation. I know people are really into their pets. C.S. Lewis said something besides the notification or the uh, showing you that where God says, let us make man in our own image that we're distinct. C.S. Lewis said this, he says, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your, sen 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 uh, your senses. I'll spit it out in a second. I want to talk about murder for just a minute because it's, uh, it's incredible what's going on. It's horrible that uh, we are having to deal with what we deal with in our country and even around the globe. The number of deaths by murder, homicide, and this is stats from 2021, that was the, the newest that I could find that had all this other information, were 26,000, over 26,000 people were murdered in the United States in 2021. That's a lot of people, isn't it? That's a, a pretty good sized town, little city, isn't it? That many people were murdered in the United States. That's a repeated number. It's been way worse since 2020. You know what all happened when the pandemic and all the other things that went on in 2020. Uh, and they always want to point out the firearms. I noticed every statistic I looked at, they kept wanting to point out how many firearm uh, murders took place. Remember this about guns or knives. I saw a video yesterday, maybe you did. I think the city was Atlanta. This guy was mowing people down and the policeman jumped in right behind him, rammed his truck and stopped him within about 30 seconds. But he had already run over some folks. So I, I, I bring that up because it's never the instrument, it's the person that does the murdering, doesn't it? It's important to remember that. Uh, I'm a gun owner and I know we have many gun owners in our church. And long as you know what you're doing and you've been trained on that, and uh, that is a statement of just fact, it is the person that commits a murder, right? But you hear this terminology now, and I've even got it in these stats uh, about uh, the number of deaths that are firearm uh, homicides. Uh, let me just share something with you that I think you'll find really, really important that you know these things about this issue. Murder, killing is a worldwide issue for the entire globe. And I want to talk to you about this. Life is sacred. Don't ever forget that when God made you, he made something incredible. 
You're a human being made in the image of God, in the likeness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We too are a triune being where we have a spirit, we have uh, our, our soul, our mind, we have literally our body, and like the Trinity itself where we have even today, I have this water here, and I'm making everybody thirsty, but water can take three forms, can it? It's the same substance. It can appear as a liquid. It can get heated to the point of boiling and become a vapor or gas. And it can be frozen when it's uh, below uh, 32 degrees. Uh, and it can become ice, can it? It can become a solid. But it's the same substance, isn't it? It's just in its different forms. Much like the Trinity in many of those uh, illustrations uh, will fail at some point. But God has made us in his image. And I want to show you some things that are really important. Let's talk about not just life is sacred and that that means each person, but an unborn child. Let's talk about the unborn for a few moments. You know, we had Roe versus Wade. We've been fighting this uh, issue for five uh, decades. And finally, the very court that allowed it on a mass scale across the United States reversed Roe versus Wade and gave it to the states. That's why last week when I was recognizing um, Monica here last week and sharing with you that this fight's not over. She represents the Pregnancy uh, Resource Center here in Grand Prairie. It's not over, is it? Because we still have abortions taking place. And the more liberal a state is, the more abortions are going to happen in those states. And you even saw in the debate, if you watched that a couple nights back, where they were talking about the heartbeat uh, uh, legislation of trying to get that in all the states where at least at 15 months and beyond, they couldn't have an abortion if there is a heartbeat that is detectable. I want to share something with you. Listen. This is not a political statement. Listen, life begins at conception. How do I know that? Well, I want to take you to some scripture. In fact, I want to just take you to one passage. It's important for us to realize that a fetus, uh, a baby is not just a fetus. It's not just tissue that's there in the womb. You've got a person, a developing life that is there. Go with me if you would. And uh, this battle's still going to be fought on these state levels. It's going to be uh, like continued warfare because that's the way it's been. But go with me to Psalm 139. Look at what it says. God says through his servant David, and listen to David giving this prophetic word. For you created my inmost being. You uh, knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know them full well. My frame was hidden. Uh, when, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, and I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Does this sound like a life to you? Does this sound like a person? All the days ordained for me are written in your books before one of them came to be. Do you listen? You hear the foreknowledge of God about every single person that's ever lived and had a life? It's important that we affirm that. I appreciate Mother Teresa and her life and her giving of herself to those that uh, in India. But when she was recognized for her Nobel Peace Prize, in part of her statement, I want you to hear what she said. It was profound. Mother Teresa responded to them giving her the Nobel Peace Prize, and she said this, I think that today peace is threatened by abortion too, which is true war, a direct killing of a child by their own mother, Today, abortion is the worst evil and the greatest enemy of peace. Because if a mother can kill her own child, what will prevent her from killing herself? 
or us killing ourselves or one another? And then she answered the question, nothing. Look at how people do not value life. Now, I've been places, and I've been in India, and I want to tell you something. Their devaluing of life is, is it's, it's just something to see. It's, uh, I, I, I can't even put in words what I heard and saw and felt while I was there. But there was a devaluing of life. Um, everything was related to the caste system and their value of somebody and somebody having more value than somebody else. Uh, was profound. But I want us to remember that it's our job as the body of Christ to remember life is sacred and to stand up for the unborn. I also want you to realize that those that are sick, aging, or dying, it is our responsibility to stand for them. We have never lived in a culture where medical science is so advanced that we can extend life and we can also take life. And in medical science these days, we've got to be careful that we understand life still remains sacred, doesn't it? Life is sacred. It is to be valued. We uh, don't, uh, I remember when I first heard the t term when I was 17, 18 years old of euthanasia. And uh, started understanding that there are people that are of a mindset that if they think someone's life quality has diminished to a degree that they would not want to live that themselves or they think they are of no value to the society anymore, that they can go ahead and in a merciful way end that life. Well, you just don't find that taught in the Bible. Life is precious. Life is sacred. I don't have any business taking that into my own hands, and I want to share with you it's important that we understand that there is that issue to contend with as well. Let me move you to another subject, the oppressed, the persecuted, the slaughtered. Right now, we are focused on what? All you hear about on the news, you hear about Ukraine and Russia. Well, there are other battles going on around the globe. And there are people being slaughtered there every day. And I want to tell you something. There are times that God calls us to stand up against injustice and even go to war. There's things worth fighting for and even being in warfare. But I want to remind you that it's interesting to look at this and all the conflicts that are going on in the world that are not being talked about at all. You have to look them up to find out anything about this. The Council of Foreign Relations, and here's what's so sad, they, they all differ. So I'm going to share with you three or four right now. The Council of Foreign Relations of Go Global, Conflict, Global, uh, Global Conflict Tracker says that there are presently 27 ongoing conflicts worldwide. In other words, 27 w uh, wars going on. Well, Wikipedia, which I know a lot of people don't want to use Wikipedia, but Wikipedia this same year is telling us that there's about 40 global conflicts or conflicts around the globe. And then if you look at a, a group that uh, studies warfare and conflict between people groups, uh, the Geneva Academy, they claim that there are 110 armed violent cases. That's how they... They classify warfare. Armed, 110 armed violent cases going on in the world. Now, I want to speak to you about another, another slaughter that's going on. We support the voice of the martyrs as one of our global impact ministries. I want to introduce you, if you haven't become familiar with the Open Door uh, group that works around the world. Uh, there's under other groups like Nina Shea. He made so many aware in 2000 when he came out with the book, The, the Lion's Den, talking about how many were still being tossed into the lion's den of persecution, much like the, the boys uh, back in, in Daniel's day. So I want you to look with me at something that uh, you were, hopefully you were given this, you were supposed to be, if you don't have one. 
You can grab one uh, a little later. But it's a world map. And it is a picture of Open Doors 2023 report. Now, we should be aware of this besides missionary organizations being aware of this. You know, Kelly? We as the Church of Jesus Christ, Mark, these things should be known to the body of Christ. We took some time in my class back in the spring to make this known. I want to draw your eye to the one that's here on the screen, which is this one, without the listing of the 50 biggest violators. And that's what you'll have on your page. They're listed out on the side, and we have these printed in the foyer, and they're out here on the side. Do you want this? There were 5,621 people that were slaughtered for their faith. They were put to death. They were, they were martyrs last year, 2022. They died for Jesus. Now, these are the ones that are documented. The number goes far beyond this, but they have to have some, they've got some means of how they have to document this, and they've got a way that they do that, and we know the number's higher than this. North Korea is number one on the biggest violator list again this year. Now, the reason I point this out is because I want you to understand something. I can't ignore that as a pastor. I can't ignore that as a Christian. I have 5,600 and some brothers and sisters that died because they professed Jesus and they weren't willing to bow when they were asked to. Sometimes they were asked, sometimes they were not. But this is how many confirmed cases. The number is probably, it probably is double that. This number is going up. Since 2018, this number has gone from being an annual number of about 3,000. Now, part of it may be we're able to document things better now. But part of it is that this number just keeps going up. You need to know, you need to pray, and you need to do what you can to do something about the slaughter of Christians around the globe. Let, yes, we're having things happen in the United States, and they're trying to take our rights away, and they're trying to shut us up, but these people are dying. You get me? They're dying for Jesus. Now, they'll be rewarded. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation there's a special place in heaven for those that have been martyred for the faith. They have a special place in the kingdom, place of, place, place of speckle, special recognition. But you need to be aware this is going on. 5,621 confirmed cases. We know that the reality is much worse. But this is what they've been able to confirm with their system of confirmation, which is quite thorough. I want to take you to another place. And this is where uh, that's just kind of worldwide on some issues you need to understand. You better be in the loop on murder on the issues we just talked about. But now let's talk about how this message applies to your life and your practice and you uh, like so many people will say, well, hey, Sunday's on murder. It's the Ten Commandments. Not guilty. I'm out on this one. Are you? Let's talk about this understanding Jesus and what he had to say about it. You could not, uh, very Few people are going to be guilty of actually taking someone's life, and there, obviously there's forgiveness for that. But let's go to the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, and talk about this a little more thoroughly. Clarence uh, Darrow wrote a very comical way of putting this. He said, <laughs> he said, I haven't killed anybody, but I have read a whole lot of obituary, obituaries with glee. You'll get that at lunch today. All right. You ever been happy somebody got it socked to them? You ever prayed, get them, God? 
There's some psalms like that. There are. The Bible says, I want you to hear this. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, I'm going to share several Proverbs because they give a lot of insight on this subject of murder, and it kind of ties into what we're going to do in talking about what Jesus said. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, the wise one, Solomon, taught us that the tongue has power of life and what? And death. We can speak words of life and we can speak words of what? Listen, if you have ill will in your heart towards someone, you better check that. As Christians, we're not allowed. We're not allowed to do that. I want to show you something. Jesus, just like he told us about adultery in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to speak to the subject of murder. And he's going to tell you that you can be guilty of committing murder or be under judgment of Almighty God. What did he tell us about the sexual sin of adultery? He said that you don't have to physically commit it to be guilty, right? He told us, he said, he's talking mainly to men. He said that if we look on a woman and we lust, imagine uh, being with them, that we are guilty of committing adultery where? In our heart. One thing about God, he knows all about us, doesn't he? He knows your thoughts. He knows everything that's in your mind. Well, we read on in this passage, and I want to take you to a passage in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus talks about the subject of murder, but then he tells us about judgment that is further than that. Look at this. I'm in Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in verse 21, you've heard it said that it, you've heard, you've heard it, heard it that it was said to people long ago. And he uses those phrases over and over throughout the book of uh, Matthew uh, five, six, and seven, the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said long ago, do not commit murder. Now watch how he gives proper interpretation, just like he did about the sexual sin of adultery. Look what he says. And anyone who murders will be subject to what? To judgment. Horrible crime, isn't it? But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. We can become so angry, have it be uncontrolled, not being, uh, have, ever having a heart of forgiveness, and we can be guilty of doing this in our heart where you wish evil upon somebody with this subject of judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, you will be in danger of hell fire. Jesus is telling us much like the interpretation of the adultery issue that you can commit this in your heart, never committing the physical act and be guilty. We need to understand that if you have uncontrolled anger towards somebody, you better watch out because you can be guilty of committing this in your own heart and falling under judgment. You know, look at the scriptures. I want to share with you a couple of passages. Go to Solomon again. In his great wisdom, he says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24 and 25, he says, do not make friends with a hot-headed man. Listen to why. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. <clears throat> we have to engage the culture, don't we? We have to engage with people and share Christ with people. But then we, when, when we disengage, we, we reserve our close, intimate friendships for other believers, right? Why? Because what is in the world will rub off on you, won't it? It sure will. Listen, if someone's practicing anger, hatred, those things will run off, rub off on you. Solomon again says in Proverbs 29, 22, an angry man stirs up dissension. A hot-tempered one commits many sins. If you can't control your anger, you're up the creek without a paddle. You need Jesus. You need the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You need to follow the habits of a new creation where you have kindness and patience about you. Why? Because you can be guilty of the very same thing. 
Not, you're like, hey, I thought I was off today. No, you're not. Listen, the family is a place where a lot of anger is exhibited. I wanted to share something with you. Do you know that they, they believe that most years, about 60% of the murders are committed by somebody, physical murder, that 50, 60%, right at 60%, just under it, are committed by people that are either in their family or they know them. How about that? Listen to this. They know that 5 million women in 2021, the year right after 2020, where there were so, the, these numbers soared during that time. They know that 5 million women were abused by someone supposedly that loved them, the man that they were with. Isn't that crazy? 5 million women in 2021. They also shared that about 10 million children were physically abused and verbally abused by the people they call their parents. Step parents, people they lived with. Sociologists, you know, ch children should just not be treated like that, amen? Sociologists and psychologists have reported that the closest attitude that comes to murder, they believe, is the step away from actually hating someone and having uncontrolled anger. How about that? Anger leads to hatred. Hatred leads to murder. And if you're not listening, you better be paying attention now. I want you to notice one more thing with me. I want you to go to a passage in the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to wrap up with this. Ephesians chapter 4, there's a passage that deals with anger. And I want to share with you, it says, In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. You guys back that up one. All right? Let's go back one. There you go. Thank you. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. You see where anger is so much of an issue for us? And do not give the devil a foothold. Listen, these mountain climbers, they have footholds. They get a place where they can stand. That's exactly what you're doing to the devil himself. You're allowing him and the satanic, demonic forces to have a foothold in your life, a place to stand if you practice hatred. Notice this. He who has been stealing still no longer must work and do something useful with his own hands and may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need, that it may be benefit, uh, that it may be benefits those, those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So this is talking to the Christian community. It's the church at Ephesus initially, now us. And he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, which you were sealed at the day of redemption. We were given the gift of the Holy Spirit at conversion. God now, his spirit is talking to us. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit in you by behaving in ways that are unbecoming to the body of Christ. And he says this. Get rid, and I want you to notice this. Look at the labels that God has Paul give us that are increasing anger issues, and they, they just continue to ratchet up. Watch this. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of ma malice. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. I want to end today with a true story, a Texas story that's almost, it's, it's, you just have to hear it. This guy, it happened to me yesterday. I kid you not. My wife was in the car and she can verify my attitude and how I handled this, okay? I'm in the turn lane. Turn lane turns green. You know, it doesn't last as long as the other green lights. You know what happened. You know where I'm going because you have it happen to you all the time. The person in front of me wasn't paying attention. 
They were doing something. They were texting, doing something on their phone. They're fooling in their car, but their head's down, and I can see their head's down, and I'm like, it's going to turn yellow. And sure enough, it turned yellow. And when it turned yellow, here his head pops up, or hers. I don't know if it was male or female. I just know they were not paying attention. And the light turned yellow. And anyway, uh, I, get, I get through this one with, with the person and get through before it's red. The person behind me, I heard him honking. And you been there, done that? Anybody? Well, let me tell you another Texas story. Real deal. It's a woman. She pulls up behind a guy. She sees, and uh, two, it's a turn lane. She sees that he uh, is got his phone. He's pulled it off. It's the little thing on the, the dash, and he's on it, and he's, it looks like he's looking through papers. Light turns green, no movement. Light turns yellow, and he sees it, and she starts honking her horn, and he gets through the light, and the light turns red, and guess who didn't get to go through? This lady. So she starts beating on the steering wheel. She's yelling. She puts her window down. She lays out outside the window. She's screaming at the man and how he's an idiot, and she said some other things that I can't say. And she's yelling and screaming and she's beating. And then she's honking the horn over and over and over. And she just has an old-fashioned Texas hissy fit. If you don't know what a hissy fit, everybody knows what a hissy fit, raise your hand. All right. You guys talk to them. Come see me after I'll talk to you. She has a hissy fit. All of a sudden, she hears a police car siren go off. There's been a policeman sitting behind her watching this whole thing play out. He comes up beside her and, and you, you know, all this is all issues for us today. He, uh, he takes his gun out of his holster and stands at an angle at the door and tells her, get out of the car. You say, oh, is this a police brutality story? No. He had gotten a, 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 an alert earlier on his computer that there was a car just like this car, but with a different license plate number, but it was the same make and model, that it had been stolen. So, anyway, he holds the gun on her. She's like, no, no, you see what that idiot did? Don't you get me, you go after him. He says, get out of the car. He, she turns around, gets out of the car. He checks her to see if she has any weapons. And then he handcuffs her and puts her in his car and takes her to jail. You say, well, what? Well, lo and behold, there's a story behind the story. So, after she's been processed, fingerprinted, had her mug shot, since that's been a big deal this week, has her mug shot. She gets her phone call. Lawyer comes down, gets her out, and the policeman that arrested her actually comes back to the police station because they have found out that she has nothing to do with what he, he, he uh, arrested her for. It, so he's there to talk to her, and he said, Ma'am, I am so sorry that I put you through that. But we had just had a warning put out on our computer system of a car just like yours that had been stolen. And I just assumed this was the car and maybe the plates had been changed because it's the same color, everything. And you had on the back of your car, follow me to church, to such and such church where lives are changed. She said, you also had around your license plate that you're for life, you're against abortion, and then you also had on your car that ichthus thing you Christians have. You know, that fish symbol that means Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. And I just assumed that couldn't be your car 
the way you were carrying on, and I thought you stole that car. That woman was in women's ministry at her church and admits she has had a terrible problem with her anger. Lesson learned? You think this might apply to you on some level? You hadn't killed anybody? You got any ill will in your heart towards anybody? You got any hatred towards somebody? It's pretty easy to pick up on. They can't do anything right, and you know their motives. Bam. I'm going to drop the mic right there.